You're listening to the Mindful Mama Podcast, Episode 74. Today we're talking about simplicity parenting. Welcome to the Mindful Mama Podcast. Here it's about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. At Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you are thriving, when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm your host, Hunter Clark Fields, Mindfulness Mama Mentor. I coach overstressed moms on how to cultivate self-awareness in their daily lives and to take family and life to a new level of awakening. I've been practicing yoga and mindfulness for over 20 years, and I'm the creator of the Mindful Parenting Course, and I'm the mom of two girls, ages 7 and 10. Thank you so much for being here today, my dear listener. I'm really, really excited to share this work, this um, interview and this person's work with you today. It's all Today I'm talking to... Kim John Payne. And Kim is the author of what for me is a really seminal work, Simplicity Parenting. And it's a a book that has really left impact. And he now leads trainings and things like that in Simplicity Parenting. I'm going to tell you in my introduction to him why this work is so important to me. So I'll leave that for as we get into our interview. It's summertime. If you're listening to this in real time here in Delaware, it is hot and humid out here. Uh, but there are things going on. Uh, like I've announced before, I am doing a lot of writing these days. So I'm spending a lot of time on writing. But if you want to work with me, you can go and check out hunteryoga.com slash work with me. And there are courses there. There's the Stop Yelling Formula course, and there's the Daily Practice course, which are amazing and really helpful. So go check those out. And um, I may have one spot open on one-on-one coaching, so you can email me about that at hunter at hunteryoga.com, or you can apply for a clarity session, and we'll just do a free call and talk to each other. And, you know, sometimes I think we think that coaching is for um, either either people who have really, really, really need like enormous help in the world or they're really wealthy or things like that. And I just want to tell you that that's not the case. Um, I, My clients I've worked with, they are stay-at-home moms, that some of them are entrepreneurs, uh, teachers. Actually, I have a had a couple of teachers work with me and um, and it's it's really for everybody it's really for you if you are feeling overwhelmed you're feeling stressed and you know that you are ready for a change so you can check that out also under the work with me section so that's it let's dive into this interview this is this is an incredible person incredible work I really encourage you to read simplicity parenting I've taken parts of this this work and infused it into many of my blog posts and work. So enjoy. So welcome. I'm so glad you're here today. I'm talking to Kim John Payne, and I am so excited to talk to him because Kim is the author of Simplicity Parenting. And I was just checking the book because it was published in 2009. And by way of introduction to Kim, I just have to tell you, well, welcome, Kim. Let, first, let me just say that. Thank you. <laughs> I have to say, so your book, I was just checking, it was published in 2009. I have the hardcover copy. And, and I must have bought the, your book when it first came out. Um, and because my, my daughter was two years old and I was like, ah, and I remember doing my first toy purging <laughs> and simplifying and decluttering her room when she was two years old and remember feeling like, oh my gosh. And she was so excited. It was so beautiful. She was so thrilled. And then I was so taken by your message of the book that I, um, I ended up leading a book club several times on simplicity parenting at the Montessori school where I was volu- well, where I, my daughter was going, I had to do some volunteer hours. So I did that by leading book clubs of Simplicity Parenting. And it's just an incredibly life-changing book. And for Kim, this, and you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like Simplicity Parenting has just taken off. It sort of has a life of its own. You have trainings and a website, et cetera. So um, welcome to the Mindful Mama podcast, Kim. Tell us about... How did this, how did simplicity parenting 
come about? And, and what were some of the problems that you were seeing in the world that, that led you to, to do this work? Yeah, it was um, unusually uh, young age when I was, um, uh, I volunteered actually to work in various war-torn areas and difficult er areas that were experiencing a lot of problems in Southeast Asia when I was actually just in my early 20s. And so I saw a lot of um, dislocations, saw a lot of stress, highly, highly stressed and traumatized children and spent time there helping and doing what I could. And then um, became more and more interested in how one could help very, very stressed and traumatized children. So I moved to the to the West. I moved to London, and and did some um, postgraduate study. And I set up a little um, counselling practice um, a, as well on the side. And through the door came children who looked just like the children in the Thai Cambodian refugee camps, or just like in the slums of Jakarta. The, um, they looked very stressed, very drawn, very pale, anxious, um, and um, just they, they looked just like the kids I'd, I'd been working with a very, very short time before, only these kids, they looked like wartime kids, and, and it was a huge puzzle, actually, and um, the more I, I thought about it, and I, it was a difficult thought, um, actually, um, it, was, wasn't an, it wasn't an easy one, Hunter, because it was a little bit overwhelming because I, I, I thought, well, how could this possibly be, you know? Um, but I came to think of it as the undeclared war on childhood, actually. There was something, what I did when I d um, dug into their biographies, what I came to understand is that it wasn't so much war that was going on <clears throat> in terms of, of exploding shells and in terms of having to flee the enemy. The enemy was within the enemy wasn't out there. The enemy was within, and it was within the lifestyle. And the more I helped these children and parents simplify and balance their lifestyle, the 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 the, the more these children <clears throat> return back just to being their quirky selves, just their lovable, regular selves. And um, so that's for me was a, um, a the beginning um, uh, of of a path of of understanding that. Our, our lives have just gotten too much. There's, there's just, it's too fast. It, it, the kids get shown too much, too young. It's too sexy. Um, it, it, it's, um, it's just overwhelming our kids. And so, yeah, I guess the rest is history because I've, I've spent the last 30 years um, from that point on um, helping uh, families and also training, helping train coaches and real grassroots movement in being able to understand the power of less. So it, when, you, when you talk about this idea that there's too much and too young and everything's overwhelming our kids, my, the question that comes up for me is that like we are in this culture, right? Like we're embedded in this culture where every restaurant has, you know, TV screens going and everybody's on their phones all the time, et cetera. So, when you were in that position of seeing those children, I mean, granted, it was probably a little bit different then and, and maybe even less then, but see, seeing these children, what I'm wondering is like, sir, you, you know, you're like a fish in the water. <laughs> so how do you see, how do you, how do you see that this is the problem versus something else? Well, it's because of, because of the overwhelming studies, the, um, the, the, the evidence that studies are coming out with now. It's not just, you know, it's, it's really interesting that, um, you know, back in the um, mid 80s when I was working with this and earlier, actually, um, it was um, it was a little bit counterculture, you know, saying this kind of stuff was counterculture. Now you can hardly pick up a magazine, a newspaper with something about the overwhelm of kids, screens overwhelming them, the pressures of high stakes testing, the No Child Left Intact Act. Um, you know, you, you, um, it's everywhere. So this has become, it's become a question on so, that so many people carry around with them. And I guess where simplicity parenting has blossomed so much in so many countries around the world, I think there's like 31 translations of the book now. And we have approaching a thousand coaches just about on every continent in the world. Um, 
And soon we're, we'll be joining that with a simplicity parenting discipline and guidance coaching training. They're simple little trainings. It would, well, it would be ironic if they were complicated. <laughs> but, um, but it's really just to be a grassroots listener and facilitator of bringing parents together. It's not a therapeutic training. But um, the, the, um, now, now that, that quiet voice that hang on, this is out of whack, something is wrong, um, has grown, as the pressure has grown on kids, parents often, you know, just got that feeling of, hey, something is wrong. None of us had to cope, or very few of us had to cope with anything like what our kids have to cope with nowadays. Uh, and it's, and, so, and no matter how many, how many times people say to us, school, particularly school folk, um, say to us, well, it's just the way things are. It's just the way it is. Our gut instinct says, no, no, it's actually not. So the, the voice that I raised many, many years ago, which I, I must confess was, I, I, you know, counterculture. It was felt to be a little strange, particularly through in the affluence of the late 80s to the mid 90s. It was like, great, you know, we're, <clears throat> we're doing so well. Let's get, let's more and more and more. You know, I, I recently a very dear friend of mine who's an evolutionary biologist did a, ran, ran some figures for me because I asked her, I said to her, you know, our, so many of our kids are, are, are really um, struggling with the amount of adrenaline and cortisol in their systems and, and particularly dopamine as well, pleasure, just because of screens, we're wiring our kids to only motivate when it's pleasurable, which is a really big worry because um, uh, the learning studies have it just recently said, which was one of the biggest studies ever conducted, 55,000 kids by um, Brandeis University and the um, National Institute of Mental Health. The, um, found that the number one uh, uh, factor in, in children's uh, study uh, success and later success in life was grit, was grit and determination and staying with something when it was a problem, even though it was uncomfortable. Now, you put that right alongside um, the fact that we're wiring our kids uh, to be pleasure-centered through dopamine release, which is um, very much, <clears throat> you know, a thought-out process with, with um, TV, um, video game developers, and so on. Uh, and we're raising a, 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 a group of kids who it's gonna, they're going to struggle to succeed if grit is the most important determination of whether kids can actually succeed in life. And that's that's just common sense, right? When you've got a problem and you keep going at it. Well, but the kind of pace of life we've got on one hand, it's stressing our kids, the adrenaline and cortisol, fight or flight. And on the other hand, it's, it's wiring them for pleasure. And, and that is a very... <clears throat> dynamic and difficult cocktail when that's going on. So, so quite often, um, um, you know, when I'm when I'm out, you know, in the world, as I often, very, very often, am doing workshops and so on. I'm actually um, there'll, there'll usually be a dad or two who'll just say, "Hey, that's just the way the world is now. It's just the way it is." And you know, you got to get your kids on screens. You've got to get them into all these. Um, programs you just it's a fast life now and that's you know if they're going to succeed that's the way it has to be and and actually i think it's just the opposite it's exactly the opposite um otherwise why did steve jobs not have screens for his kids when he was asked why he didn't have screens for his kids he answered he he wanted them to be um he wanted them to actually be um innovative he didn't want them to passively stare at someone else's innovation if we want to have kids that succeed, you see, simplicity parenting is all about setting kids up for success. Because when we allow them time to play, time in nature, time to work it out with siblings, just time to have connection with families, we establish a base camp. You know, we just establish a base camp for life. And we allow them to develop grit, determination, problem solving, all that is is done when we give kids the space to do it. It's not done with endless clubs and classes and screens and toys and just being – otherwise, we end up with kids who have this really false sense of entitlement and also a passivity of spirit. They just – 
expect to be served. And we all want to raise kids with a spirit of gratitude, not with that sense of entitlement. That worries every parent. Mm. When I read Simplicity Parenting, I was really struck by you write about some um, some working with some kids who were diagnosed with ADHD um, in some in private schools somewhere. Can you tell us about the the studies and, and what you did putting these kids through a simplicity regimen? Yeah, yeah, private and public schools. The um, what we did is 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 that we took a cohort, a large cohort of kids. Um, who were diagnosed with ADHD, both um, inattentive and hyperactive. And um, we, um, uh, um, to start the program, they had to be, um, you know, Ritalin or Adderall, whatever, free, um, not using medications of that sort, um, methylphenidates and so on. And um, we um, engaged them in a protocol of balancing out their lives, of unstressing, of simplifying, and we had various protocols and we had various cohorts. We had some kids who uh, were just simplifying at home. We had other kids who were simplifying um, only at school, and then other kids who were simplifying and balancing out their lives in both. Then we had another group who we could um, track who were still in touch with screen media, and we had other kids who we could track who, who went screen media free. So it was a pretty, pretty comprehensive study. Um, and what we found is that the kids who adhered most of the protocol, who um, had dialed it back at home, who had, whose teachers very kindly agreed to just balance and, and calm it down at school, help with the transitions, help them with not piling on so much homework and so on, um, and the kids who were screen free, um, no videos, no TVs, no, no computers and so on. Um, they 68% went from clinically dysfunctional to functional within four months. We retested them. They were above the 92nd percentile when we first started working with this, according to you know the fairly rigorous um, protocol that we ran to come up with that data. And then um, within four months, 68% um, of them were um, back when we retested to being actually you couldn't detect ADHD. It, it, it simply wasn't there, which is controversial, right? Because ADHD is supposed to be hardwiring. Um, you, you're not supposed to be able to heal. You're not supposed to be able to, uh, in such a short, in fact, we were seeing uh, improvements after three weeks, but we didn't retest until four months. Um, and, you know, I'm not claiming this to, to be the, the, the be all and end all, all studies. There are many studies that have come afterwards that, that, that you know, back up what we found as well. But um, what, what I came out of that study with was, was a pretty simple way of looking at it. I mean, it was a pilot study. Um, others, have, as I said, have followed up. But um, I, I, think of it, I think of it actually um, this way, Hunter, that all kids are quirky. They all have their little quirks that makes them lovable and kind of infuriating too. <laughs> but, it, but, you know, it's just who they are. If we add what I think of as cumulative stress to their lives, under the radar stress, in this undeclared war on childhood, with, it's the, the, the highly stressed child, but the daily stress has become the new normal. It's become ubiquitous. But if we, um, add, if we put cumulative stress into that quirk, that quirk becomes, I think of it as inflamed. The kids almost get like a soul fever, an emotional fever. And what happens is that, that quirk, like a busy kid, will become hy the hyperactive kid. The, the kid who um, is feisty will become opposition defiance disorder. The kid who is, um, just likes things, is very orderly, will become obsessive compulsive. But by, you know, and that's a grim picture, right? But by... Um, and either diagnosed or undiagnosed, but they just go into difficulty. Their quirk becomes inflamed. What we found is that when we were simplified and balanced their lives, that quirk, that quirk not only reappeared, they didn't only slide back along a spectrum just to being quirky again. And many parents said, you know, like, I feel like I've got my little boy back. I feel like I've got my teenage girl back. You know, it was remarkable. You know, parents were you know, in, in tears, as they were saying this very often, but something altogether 
um, just very unexpected happened. Because as we continued the study, not only did those quirks just, they came back just to being their lovely quirk, quirky little self, but those quirks actually kept sliding along with the spectrum and they became their gifts. For example, the child with ADHD, so-called ADHD, which actually, it's such a silly term, ADHD, it's like attention deficit. It's not actually attention deficit, it's attention excess. That's the first thing. And it's a, it's a difficulty to prioritize their attention. We've all got multiple attentions, but these kids just find it difficult to prioritize. And the reason they find it difficult to prioritize, like what they should be focusing on now, like in the classroom, as opposed to the four square game at recess and then pizza for lunch, they put pizza at the top, four square second, and, and the algebra third, right? Of course. <laughs> and, they're, and, and they're thinking about the games at recess because that's the high stimulation, Right. That's that's and they're a bit nervous. They're anxious about it. They want to get out there. They they want to they want to move because they have to move in order to relieve the stress. Take the stress out of their lives. Give these kids a childhood. Allow them decompression time. And that same child who's hyperactive is whose quirk is just that they're a busy kid. Their gift is that they are uh, movers and shakers. Only now they have a good sense of timing, they have a good sense of appropriateness, and they have a sense of how <clears throat> their actions will affect others. Because now they're not in fight or flight. When they're in fight or flight, they couldn't think about how their actions would affect others. They were in survival mode. If we calm their lives down, calm them out of adrenaline and cortisol raging through their systems, then these kids are amazing. They are such leaders. They are so kind. They, they really um, are wonderful kids, only now they have a sense of timing and a sense of empathy. And we found that with diagnosis after diagnosis, that when kids, I'm not suggesting that they are not prone to hyperactivity or obsessiveness or opposition, uh, uh, you know, uh, defiant behavior, they are prone to it. That is hardwiring. They're prone to it. But where that goes, either to their to the fever or to the gift is is significantly impacted by whether we want to give these kids a childhood or not. Mm. I love I love that idea of giving giving them a childhood. And it's interesting because you talk about that fight, flight, or freeze response in the children, which is something I teach to moms and parents in the mindful parenting course about how when we are in those that, you know, that lower brain stress response, that it literally cuts off access to the thoughtful. Um, creative, imaginative parts of our brain, you know, that prefrontal cortex. And of course, it's the same in kids. But it's interesting that it's this is not because our kids are in a horrible environment. This is because we are on purpose stimulating our kids. Yep. Yep. I mean, that's the, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's really amazing to see the the, the tens, if not hundreds of thousands of parents around the world who are working with our coaches, how they reclaim family life um, when they simplify and balance. And it's not, it's not that one needs to opt out of modern life. It's, one, it's, it's simply the fact that we need to question it and, and, and give what is right at the right time. We need, in a sense, to be... To be um, sentinels. We need to stand at the gate of our family life and let in what we're comfortable with and hold out what we are not and and just feel completely okay about saying, no, you know what, we've had a play date already this week and there was a sports practice. So no, we're, we're just going to have a couple of quiet afternoons at home after school. Because you know what it's like, Hunter, you pick your kids up after school and they're on a roll. You know, schools are incredibly busy places. Schools, in, in a sense, also need to think very carefully, school professionals, educators, about the amount of stress they're putting kids under. And they don't wake up in the morning thinking, huh, I wonder how I can stress my class today. I mean, you know, they, they, they're, they're, they're loving and kind people, but we've come to accept the pace of life and it's, that, that is simply overwhelming our kids. Um, the, the evolutionary neurologist that I mentioned just a moment ago, I asked her, how long would it take for the brain to adapt if, um, if we were to cap 
adrenaline, adrenaline cortisol, fight, flight, freeze, and actually flock as well. That that tendency to 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 um, develop clicks at school. Um, um, how long would it take until the until, as you mentioned, the frontal lobes, the neocortex? Um, how um, how long would it take for that to kick back in and not have the amygdala hijack the the the, the base brain? The reptilian brain hijack. I think of it like the like the lizard mm-hmm. king. You know? <laughs> um, how long would that take until we could actually a child could cope with that, given the normative data that we have available? And she went away. And she's a very very thoughtful person, um, a long long time tenured professor, and she came back saying, "Well, you, you know, we as we both suspected, the brain would adapt, but um, given optimal." Um, uh, environment, it would probably take about nine hundred to twelve hundred years. So, so, so we've got we've got nine to twelve hundred years ahead of our kids' ability to deal with all this stuff. We have gotten so far, and like, why? Why have we done this? Well, it's 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 a it's multi layered. But I tell you what, a really big part of it is marketing forces <clears throat> that have just have just drawn us in to wanting more and more and more, that, that, that more is better, bigger, better, more. And, the, and just to stand up to the marketing forces, even just that piece, just to say, you know what, my child playing in the backyard with, with just in nature, going to the park, um, messing around the, the stream, the creek, I would, you know, I'm going to, and not buying them anything to do that, just having them find and construct things out of nature. Can we do that? Or do we have to buy stuff? And and more and more parents are deciding to let children self-construct, let, let children just have that decompression time and let them, I talk about be be bored. I don't know if you recall that. Oh thing. yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Do you? Did you try it out? Oh, of course. And in fact, that's I, I. You know, I talk to my the, my moms that I coach and I teach about. You know, that's good. It's good to let your kids be bored, and it's important. My my girls. You know, I, I use your line, Kim, that I love that you wrote in the book. Um, Something to do is right around the corner, and you know that that's a great line. So in simplicity parenting, Kim writes, say. Something to do is right around the corner and just repeat it like a broken record. And I swear it works. It's lovely. And they get annoyed at me, but I'm like, whatever, just go. <laughs> well, you know, when your kids come to you and say, we're bored, you know, and if you've got two kids like you and I have, the, the little one will poke a head around the behind, out from behind the big one and say, yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and, yeah. And, um, and uh, you know, my response to it is, like you said, oh, oh, dear. Well, something good is just around the corner. Or as since the book was written, one mum actually said to me, I, uh, what I say is when the children say, we're bored, and she says, you may be. She gives them permission. You may. Yeah. That's fine by me. Yeah. yeah That's yeah. okay. And usually within, um, and I set the stopwatch on this, and I asked a bunch of our early coaches to do this as well. And we found usually between 20 and 30 minutes of boredom. And by the way, separate them. (laughs) (laughs) Um, uh, And creativity breaks out. And creativity breaks out that lasts for between two to three hours. Now, trust that with turning on the TV because they're bored. You see, that doesn't last for three hours there's arguments that start up the kids just zone out there's no creativity that's that's where um that's where just allowing children to be bored and one of the things that um myriad parents have said is that when that 20 to 30 minute thing is only at the beginning after you um practice this for a month or two of just giving your kids the gift of boredom um then what happens is that that time comes down and down and down to in the end, it doesn't need 20 to 30 minutes at all for them to find creativity. They don't even come to you in the first place. And, um, and so the children start to have 
a life of their own and we don't need to be continually engaged as unpaid edutainers of our kids. <laughs> Amen. Right. Amen. And then, right? And then, <laughs> and then we can get on and, and, and have a life as well, you know, um, as opposed to being at the beck and call of our kids or when they grow up later to be like unpaid Uber drivers, you know, just taking them from here to there to here to there. Um, it's, it's very part of the, 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 the piece that, um, that I very much want to support is not so much that kids have space for life, but also parents have space for their lives. Uh, I'm working on a new book at the moment, um, called uh, Being at Your Best When Your Kids Are at Their Worst. And it's a book about emotional self-regulation. And a really big part of, of, of feeling good and feeling centered when our kids are, you know, have lost their way a little bit um, and are pushing your buttons and are complaining and whinging, a really big part of that actually begins way earlier than that moment it begins by having space in our own lives as parents. And one of the ways, one of the fast tracks to getting space in our lives as parents is to give our kids space. I mean, it's, it's a little bit ironic that giving, and wonderful, but giving our kids space um, actually results in us having more space. It's true. You know, I have to say that in my own life. So I read Simplicity and Parenting when my oldest daughter, who's now 10, was two. And um, and I've used these concepts throughout my life, like not only in simplifying environment, but rhythm. You know, we have our, we have a Monday night's pizza night and Tuesday's pasta and Wednesday, Thursday's rice, you know, all that sort of thing. We have those rhythm and we keep our very conscious of trying to balance our schedules and, and not do too much. And we have a, a screen-free Sunday where um, where every Sunday the whole family is screen-free. And, and the creativity that comes out on Sundays is amazing. Um, but I do have to say also that now that my girls are older, they are very, they do, they have their own lives and I have my life and we share our lives together. It's beautiful, but they have stuff they're doing. I don't have to be, you know, taking, you know, entertaining them all the time, et cetera. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that's a lovely thing. That's a lovely thing that you've got with your girls, Hunter. And it's, it's a slow cooker, isn't it? It takes a while. <laughs> yeah. 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 You need to have some, some resilience in, in the beginning, but so let's talk about some of the ways that people can simplify. Um, sometimes I think it can be a little bit scary, but I think just taking bit by bit is, uh, very helpful. And I think some of the most uh, appealing ways to simplify for parents is in the stuff, right? Is it definitely in the stuff? And I, and so we talk about, um, I've talked about simplifying our, our kids' stuff, and, and uh, my daughter was two, so I had the lovely opportunity to, like, get rid of the plastic talking, beeping things. I had this wonderful excuse. You gave me this great excuse to give me this stuff that my, they flowed into my house endlessly, and... Um, and it was really, um, really amazing. And I was totally, like I said, I was completely scared the first couple times I decluttered my daughter's spaces. And every time she would come back, like she was in this, this little preschool and she would come back and she would just be like, oh my God. And she would just, it, it was lovely for her. And she would just start playing immediately. It was amazing. So, so what about the stuff? Why should we simplify stuff? I think we've got a pretty good idea about that already, but, and, and where can parents sort of start with that if they're feeling nervous? Well, one of the, one of the things, um, and again, not just my uh, opinion, which might be interesting, but relatively boring. It's, it's like, what is the feedback from thousands and thousands of parents who have, who have simplified, you know, their environments, simplified stuff, books, toys, clothes, harsh uh, cleaning uh, uh, materials, fluids, um, harsh lighting. What's, you know, when you simplify the environment, um, what's, 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 what's with that? Why do that? Um, one of the things that a lot of parents have found is that when they simplify for example, as you were mentioning with toys, the, um, because I started counting the amount of toys because back um, 
when my pri- when I had a more expanded private practice. So I still do have a private practice, but it's a I keep it pretty small these days because I'm traveling and writing so much. But the when um, back in the days, I used to actually go into people's homes for a day from wake up time to bedtime, spread over a month. You know, otherwise it would be a bit overwhelming for the kids. But I'd visit for two or three hours at one time of the day, two or three hours at the other time of the day. And I was actually called Dr. Trashbag. It was a... <laughs> It was a very unfortunate nickname, but the um, the reason is I had a couple of big industrial trash bags with me because one of the suggestions I'd often make is that I'd go into to children's, I'd walk around the house, their playrooms, um, usually the playroom, if there was such a thing, or the bedroom, um, uh, had a ton of toys, but most of the toys were in the high traffic areas like like family rooms, actually, and I'd count them, and the, and the average um, American kid has about 500 toys um, (laughs) on the low side 200 uh, and it gets up there around 500 and that means the the 3,000 piece lego set counts as one (laughs) 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 right it's just it's 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 like it's like a plastic uh, a molded plastic tsunami and the um when we start to get rid of those toys because imagine if you've got two or three kids it's just it's it's scary how many toys there are and i'd have this big black plastic bag and we would start putting them in like the ones you mentioned all the exploding plastic beeping annoying from the unrelenting gifting in-laws from the naughty uncle you know all the all the things that just uh, the, the more expensive they are the quick more quickly they break usually the more annoying they are and the um and so into the bag, they would go. And um, then we'd be left with maybe, no, oh, it was usually about 30 to 40, sometimes 50 toys, usually less. And we would get some boxes and, um, and make a toy library, make a clothes library, make a book library, um, just make libraries, put them away in the boxes, and then cycle them in and cycle them out. Now, some parents have asked me, well, do I do this with my children and give them the choice and all this sort of stuff? And, I, um, you know, I, my answer is, well, depends on your level of masochism, actually. No, 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 you don't. Um, but you're really, really careful not to throw out the ones that are very dear to them. Um, of course, those are the ones that are kept. Now, in all these years, and it's, and it's getting on to almost three decades now where parents have been doing this, um, there's only been a handful of times when there's ever been pushback, and usually that's because a parent's made a mistake um, with throwing out one particular toy that was very dear, or there's been a, a, a deeper emotional issue um, going on. Um, but it, it, tens of thousands of parents have done this, and the kids will come back just joyful because now they, um, they've got actual toys to play with. It isn't like they're just surrounded in this bewildering uh, sea and this ocean of what do I do? Now their play can become directed. And you know what, Hunter, one of the most interesting things that has happened, and it's a very, very consistent piece of feedback, is how well brothers and sisters play together when there's fewer toys. And the parents have said to me, you know, that is so weird. We thought that if we had fewer toys, they'd fight over them. But, the, but the, um, the answer lies in the neurology. It lies in the brain science, in the kid's brain activity. When you have two things, number one is fewer toys, and number two, toys that are passive. In other words, toys that the child has to activate rather than push a button and the toy activates itself. When you have a, a, a child who needs to um, act, activate, you know, just like a, it's a, it's a big blanket. It's a it's a clothes horse, um, a clothes you know a drying rack, um, and some some big blocks and some just r- stuff that you've got to actually get busy and do something with. Otherwise, it's just a big blanket sitting on the floor. You've got to do something. When you have to do something, and you've got fewer, and there's two or three kids. What it does is it activates the limbic system in their brain because the creativity um, fires 
in the um, and activates the limbic system. And the limbic system is a part of the brain that's responsible for partly for cooperation and collaboration. So fewer toys that are more passive toys lead to the kids playing better. And so that we there are in the book and and there's and it's because the book was written as you mentioned 2009 I think it was and that was written after 10 or 12 years of working with parents to simplify so it wasn't the beginning of something it was the culmination or just a part of the story um those four pillars that I mention in the book of simplicity uh still hold interestingly 30 years later still hold true today and decluttering the environment is 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 yeah it, that that's one of the most doable of those four pillars it's fun and you know i was really kind of a little bit skeptical of um some of the uh, you know some of the toy recommendations i think you re- and one of the recommendations i was skeptical of was um you know scarves and things like that and so but but i l- you know, we we did that. I remember we we had it. We we dyed our own rainbow silk scarves with with Kool Aid and with fabric dye on the stove. It was fun. But but what I noticed over the years is that man, those scarves were amazing. <laughs> those <laughs> scarves, they loved those scarves. The scarves were everything. Like of course they were superhero capes and things like that. But they were also like they would tie to each other and they would make chains and then they would use them structurally and then they would be, you know, they would be skirts, they would be hair, they would be the the top of a building, they would be out, you know, pulling the wagon outside. I mean, they really became everything. It was quite... But, but you know, Hunter, I've got to say, fast forward um, to these years later when your girls are bigger, and you mentioned that they're now got a really good degree of autonomy, right? Well, creativity, well, first of all, safety is the first thing. But, um, you know, the child just needs to feel safe. And a child's going to be really struggling to feel safe if they're overwhelmed with too much, including toys. But once a kid has a safe base, they know they're safe. Because it's weird that, that, that the pace of modern life and the giving of just too much stuff actually stresses kids. It actually stresses them. And they... Um, you know, I go back to Eric Erickson in Psych 101 when he said, you know, all the child wants to know in the first 30 months of life is, am I safe? Am I not safe? Can I trust? Can I not trust? And um, if a child's answer is yes, I can. I'm not being overwhelmed with too many toys, too many play dates, too much screen time, just too much. The answer to that will be yes. And then, and so that releases their emotional and social development to then actually start developing autonomy and start developing higher order social and emotional skills. And it's so wonderful that for your girls, you gave them that, that a, a part of that establishing safe base was to not overwhelm them with too many toys, too much scheduling, too much screens. And now they're moving out into the world in an autonomous way. Like I've got an 18 year old daughter at the moment and she's in Europe um, working and traveling around on her own. And I've got to believe that all those years of holding back the avalanche of too muchness, allowing her time to be creative. Um, Recently she was lost. Um, She had to find, she got lost, um, in uh, Copenhagen, actually, um, and she um, didn't know what to do, and she just to- and she was in a little bit of a tricky situation late at night at a train station, and she just totally figured it out. She worked out how to keep the creepy people away, as she put it. There's some creepy guys who were following her around. She worked that out. She went to a place well lit and went into a cafe. She then got talking to to a woman there, got her directions. Um, you know, worked and, 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 and worked it all out. And, and I've got to believe and, uh, uh, um, and, uh, that all those years of having our kids problem solve by not problem solving for them, having all, all those years of letting them be bored and then 
having to be creative and letting them play together so that there were all sorts of issues that would come up and arguments and fights and conundrums and and that fast forward you know to 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 an 18 year old girl, girl lost in a train station late at night in 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 a in a strange city and she figures it out and what's more she um she writes to us with absolute you know, just this real sense of I, I did this. Mm, mm-hmm. um, it's pretty good that she she could admit that it happened as well, right? But um, <laughs> <laughs> and not have parents freaking out, or at least not letting her know we were freaking out. Um, yeah. <laughs> but but you know, it it has some pretty big implications um, later in life when we don't overwhelm our kids and we let them develop the, particularly the emotional intelligence that will come to their rescue when they need it, when, when they're leaving home. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like when I think about what I want for my daughters, I want them to feel, you know, I want them to, yes, be able to solve problems and to be successful and things like that. But also uh, beyond that too, I want them to feel comfortable in their own skin. And I feel like the idea that, you're bored and you need something to to entertain you is this idea that you're not comfortable in your own skin. And I feel like, you know, when you're safe at home in childhood, this is the time to figure this out, not when you're an adult and you're then you, you know, you can't sit still with yourself. Well, you know, I watch um, uh, I watch a lot of kids now, particularly young kids who are who are really struggling to to actually be comfortable in their own skin because they're getting messages largely through screens. We've put the most one of the most powerful tools ever invented by humankind in the hands of children. Um, we it's a, like a twenty five year unregulated social experiment that it frankly is just not going at all well, and. What they do is they get sold a bunch of ideas about how you've got to be, how you've got to talk, what you've got to do, how you've got to posture, how you've got to, you know, be, and they and and they conform to it. And they um, and what worries me about that is I know screens are creative, but they're someone else's creativity. And so what happens is that kids end up wanting to go with the crowd in order to be accepted. They have to talk a certain way, wear certain clothing, buy certain $150 sports shoes. They have to do all this stuff in order to be popular and in order to be. Now, that following the crowd, you know, if if you teach kids and you put screens in their hands that over and over are incredibly good at telling them they need this stuff to be popular, you put screens in young kids' hands that sell them that idea. How can we possibly blame them if at 15, 16, 17, they start following the crowd into some pretty dark places like drug use and so on? We have trained them to follow the crowd if we allow them access to screens when they're young and 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 not establish In a sense, as parents, we want them to follow what I think of as the true north of our family values, not the magnetic north of toxic pop culture. And yet, as an adult, how can we be authentic talking to our future teenagers about, about not going along with the crowd when we have trained them to go along with the crowd? Mm-hmm. Now, you're in Simplicity Parenting. You recommend no screen time before sort of seven, and I and I find that I find that's the place where it. I feel like it. We, I have some pushback against that because, you know, in my own life, I've had, I guess I've been a little bit counterculture in that I haven't had a TV since I was 18. We, but, you know, my husband is a, a programmer and he makes music. He makes electronic music. And he has had my daughter, my oldest daughter, he taught her some like programming and typing things when she was pretty like three years old, there was a programming thing and they've, there's a lot of real creative work that you can do on screens, uh, like making music. There's a lot of incredible music making stuff and, um, you know, like writing songs and also all the, there's incredible programming stuff. So I wonder what you think about that, that world of really creative, um, 
the way it's, you know, that tool aspect of the screens. Yeah, you know, for me, screens are like dessert. They should only be eaten after a healthy, nutritious, um, long, long, year, years long meal of family connection. There's, there's, I've no problems with screens, but the problem I have, and it would be, it'd be silly to be anti-screen in a certain sense, even though the, the, um, study after study after study, and you only have to do the most basic search, web search, um, on the screen <laughs> to, um, <laughs> to find the neurological inhibiting forces in screens. It's, it's basically damages our kids' brains. And um, it prevents myelination. And the jury is utterly, utterly in about that. Um, so there's that piece to it. But my worry with screens is, is not so much anti-screen only. It's I'm passionately pro-connection. And I'm pro Four very simple connections, and all these connections take time. The first connection is that I'm passionately pro a kid's connection to nature and to play, and screens affect that. They affect play. Again, research is just all this is for me observationally based, anecdotally based, but solidly research based. Um, the second one, I'm pr passionately pro kids having friends, real friends, not friending. So not on social network, but real friends where they have to work stuff out with the joy of friendship. But frankly, frankly, friendship's difficult too. You know, the, the anguish of friendship. You just can't click and unfriend someone. Um, and the third one is uh, I'm passionately pro, obviously, pr pro connection to family. And family life takes time and it takes, it's very slow to develop the values and screens present a, you know, for every um, little, like we can claim, oh, but they do these creative t things on screens and they absolutely do for very short periods of time. But then we've opened the door to another whole YouTubing social networking world that is that now is no longer a tool it's 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 actually controlling them rather than controlling it because kids at a young age don't have control over their impulses they we know that <laughs> little kids just don't and when we flood them with dopamine we it's it's a it's a really difficult hormonal cocktail it's a very difficult brain um cocktail that we're we're sending their way but it takes time family takes time and screens you know the kaiser family foundation study into november 2015 um found that the average american 12 to 18 year old now uh is exposed to seven and a half hours of screens per day and that doesn't include school use time Wow. And that figure now has gone up to nine and a quarter. Oh, we, my God. See, see, I've heard this a lot, Hunter, uh, and forgive me, but I've heard a lot that we do this little creative thing together with our kids on screens. And we do, and, it, and it's wonderful. It's no problem. But that opens the door to a bunch of other stuff because kids don't know how to self-regulate. And even if we do try and regulate it, it leads to a bunch of arguments and I tell you where the line gets crossed is that when we give them their own screens, because kids are pretty basic, you know, if, if I have a screen, if I have a phone and my, um, and my 12 year old daughter or son wants to look something up, I have no problems handing them the screen and we'll look up. Um, that thing they needed to know about, you know, ele elephants in the Serengeti for a school project. I have no problem, but it's my screen and I take it back after the use. Kids are basic. Who's, whose screen it is, is really, really basic. And if there are any parents listening to this podcast with very young children who are teetering on the edge of do I buy this or do I not, my advice is to, is to not, but have it be yours and then you have control of it. And then, and then fourth, I've mentioned family. I've mentioned, I beg your pardon, uh, I've mentioned connection to play and nature. 
connection to friends, real connection, real connection to family. And the fourth one is probably the one that, like if, in concentric circles, this one would be at the core. And if you imagine a sort of a rippling of a pond and those ripples right to the middle is connection to self, is really knowing your values as opposed to pop values, being comfortable, as you mentioned, in your own skin. And for me, screens are not so much, I'm not, again, I'm not so much anti-screen, but anything that, that filters and makes that watered down, like screens do, has got to be suspicious and has to be very, very carefully thought about before or even after they've been introduced. Yeah. Yeah, I can, I hear you. Well, I wish we had time to talk about all the rest of simplicity parenting, talking about rhythm and and schedules and filtering out the adult world. But I I feel like that's a, a great place to end to give us all food for thought. And um, and I'm wondering how can people act, find your work and and look at all the the work and the trainings that you're doing, Kim. Probably the the, um, the the most exciting thing that is that is um, happening in the simplicity parenting world uh, is the simplicity parenting community. We have a we have a community area on the simplicity parenting website where um, many 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 parents are ex- exchanging their ideas, supporting each other. Um, I do this little funny little thing called a simplicity diary. It's just a little five minute to seven minute piece. I do that each week. Um, I read the book and it's interesting about books because in the simplicity parenting community, I read the book, but I, but it was published so long ago and so many thousands of parents have, have kindly shared their stories with me since then. So I include lots and lots of, of new stories about what parents have discovered um, we also have workshops as well. So that's that's um, the simplicity community area, and that's probably the thing I'm, um, you know, most um, proud of really in the things that we've done over the years, because that's really bringing people together. It's not just an author writing a book saying how to do stuff. Um, it it has it has a, a, a quality of of parent to parent meeting, which I just love. So that's probably the best the best way there are there are the books and all that sort of stuff as well but that community area is something that is 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 thrilling to me well thank you so much kim i so appreciate you taking the time to come on and talk to us here Uh, it's been a it's been an honor and a pleasure hunter thanks for doing what you do Thank you so much for listening to the podcast today. I hope you enjoyed listening to Kim's suggestions. It really is inspiring to declutter and to simplify and to make life a little simpler. Like, why are we rushing around? This is our only life. We really need to um, decide how we want to live it, right? So it's interesting. I'm I'm wondering if you have any questions because he has a very different view from another guest, Devorah Heitner on Screen Time. So if you have want to start a conversation about that, um, go ahead to the mindfulmamapodcast.com mindfulmamapodcast.com and let's start a conversation in the comments about it. If you have any questions, you can always email me at hunter at hunterclarkfields.com and that's Hunter Clark Fields, Clark with an E, Fields with an S, <laughs> all strung together.com. And if you enjoyed this podcast and benefited from it, I really um, would love for you to just take some time to share it with a friend, tell someone else about it so they can benefit too. And, and to also help the podcast reach more people, it really, really helps me to subscribe and to leave a rating. Uh, I would love to uh, see an, another rating on, on iTunes. Um, there, there's kind of a sad dearth of ratings right now. We haven't had any a long time. So I really, really, really would appreciate that some ratings and reviews on iTunes. Like I said, it's summertime, so you can go to hunterclarkfields.com or hunteryoga.com and check out some of the self-study courses if you want to make this a, a summer camp of learning. 
And um, we also now have the a free, I have a free training for you and you can find that at mindfulmomguide.com. And it's a guide to help you become less reactive and to help you understand you how to create your own mindfulness practice and to walk you really right through it. Coming up, we'll have some, some more solo episodes and we'll be having Carla come back on the podcast. If you have suggestions for guests um, or topics or questions, you're welcome to email me at hunter at hunterclarkfields.com. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you for being here. I'm really gl- grateful you're here. It's a cool way to connect, isn't it? Like, it's like we're hanging out. Very cool. So, uh, and finally, my last great thank you. You know, he never hears this too. I just, <laughs> I asked him about this. So Bill does not listen to the podcast apparently. And, uh, he made the music, which is great, but he doesn't listen. So he never hears me like thank him every week for the music, but still. Thank you, honey. Thank you, Bill, for the music. Thank you to William Fields for the music. And, and you can go to WilliamFields.com and see this great stuff he does um, with audiovisual art and stuff like that. So have a great week, my friend. Namaste. Are you a mom who wants to feel less stressed and enjoy motherhood more? Do you want to be calmer with your kids and be more present for all of your life? I'm a mom who has gone from really being stressed and yelling when my kids were young to having a more grounded, more at ease relationship with life and having more enjoyable cooperative relationships with my kids and I've shown hundreds and thousands of women around the world how to do this and I want to show you how to do it too. So if you are currently feeling stuck or stagnant this is definitely for you. I've created a free downloadable audible training mindfulness for moms the superpower you need and it will show you how to respond rather than react how to let go of stress and feel more grounded in seconds how to have a smoother day today and become more present for your kids for a lifetime. To get on on this audio training absolutely free, simply visit the website www.mindfulmomguide.com.